Hey folks, it's Dr. Gilchrist. Uh, I just wanted to let you know I am feeling uh, much, much better. I've had some time to be at home and relax, and I've actually uh, got a big puppy on my lap uh, under this blanket. Um, so if you don't mind, I went ahead and I got rid of the um, I got rid of the original live stream. I'm going to go ahead and start back um, talking about Maslow's hierarchy of human need, if it's all right with you, um, just to make sure that we uh, that we can uh, go over that material, just to really make sure that you've got it. So um, the last time we were here, we were talking about the uh, three different theories of motivation. So we talked about drive reduction theory. We're talking about arousal theory. And now we're going to talk about Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of human needs. And Maslow's hierarchy basically says that certain needs will have a priority over others. So at any given point, each of us is concerned with a very particular need. Um, and generally, our most basic needs, the ones that are critical for our survival, are typically going to be the most pressing ones. Hi, Smedley. Yes, that's good. Um, and our most basic level needs have to be met first. If you can't meet those lower level needs, then you're not going to be able to focus on things like uh, self-esteem or friendship or um, figuring out what your life's purpose is. So here's kind of what I was showing you a little bit earlier today. So we have this hierarchy. And the basic idea behind this hierarchy is that your lowest level needs are at the very bottom of the hierarchy. That includes our basic physiological needs, which are really critical for things like satisfying hunger and thirst. Then we have our safety needs. We need to feel that the world around us is safe and predictable. This may include things like shelter. This may include uh, living in an area where um, you have a sense of security. Uh, you have enough money, um, your country is not war-torn, or things like that. Um, above that, we have our belongingness and our love needs, which is basically feeling like we are accepted for who we are. Following this, we have our esteem needs. And then we finish up with self-actualization, this idea of meeting your own unique potential. Now, what's really critical here is that Maslow believed that very few people actually made it to self-actualization. And that's because to reach that level of self-actualization, you actively have to have met all of these other needs. And the truth of the matter is, is that most of us do not get those lower level needs met. Some of us are struggling to find food or put food on the table. Some of us are struggling to feel safe and secure. Some of us um, are looking for friendship and feel like we don't belong. Some of us don't like ourselves and don't have a set, feel a sense of confidence. And if you don't have those things, then you can't ultimately meet your unique potential. Now, later toward the end of Maslow's life, he added another category called self-transcendence. And this is all about not only finding your potential, but finding a sense of meaning and a sense of identity that is bigger than you. It transcends you. Uh, now, you will also notice here, I am showing images of survivors of Hurricane Katrina. And part of the reason that I bring this up is because oftentimes in natural disasters, as you can see with these hurricane survivors, they are probably not focusing on dealing with the psychological aspects of the trauma that they've just gone through. Um, many of these people have lost their jobs. They've lost their, sh their homes. Um, they may have lost family members or they're fighting to stay alive. And at that point, you're trying to get these physiological and safety needs taken care of. Because of that, you're not really going to be able to process, am I living my life's potential or even Am I in a position to really process this traumatic experience that I went through um, in a healthy way? You're kind of in survival mode and you're trying to take care of those lower level needs before you take care of what potentially are less pressing issues.
but we're going to move on to talk about some of these different uh, hierarchy, these different needs right now. So we're going to focus on two. Uh, we're going to focus on our need for food, and uh, which is a physiological need. You kind of have to eat. If you don't eat, you won't live for very long. Uh, and then we are also going to focus on our need to belong. So we're gonna move on to talk about hunger and eating behavior. And sometimes this happens to me when I teach. Uh, when I teach and I'm hungry and it's been a few hours since I put food in my stomach, my stomach starts to rumble. And unfortunately it's happened that a couple of times that I've done this, um, the entire class can hear, which is really just embarrassing. Um, but you may have experienced those stomach rumbles and you may have asked yourself, does that have anything to do with my sense of hunger? And so I'm going to tell you about a weird little experiment that I was, um, that I had just started telling you before I kind of had to bow out today. So this is a really, I mean, I think it's actually kind of brilliant and it's also kind of horrifying. Um, they basically implanted uh, a balloon uh, into a researcher by the name of Washburn. This balloon contained a sensor uh, that would basically keep track of stomach contractions. And so there's a tiny little sensor in there. And basically, any time that Washburn felt hungry, he would press a button. And so they were able to see what the relationship was between these stomach contractions where your stomach actually rumbles and hunger pangs, like actually being hungry. And it turns out that when you do this, um, Washburn, uh, the research with Washburn basically found that every time that he reported feeling hungry, as you can see here, um, a, a stomach contraction was also occurring at that point. So the stomach rumbling, we intuitively think that's because we must be hungry. And it turns out that we're right. These stomach contractions start sending hunger signals to the brain, and thus we end up becoming hungry. Now, um, the area of the brain that really seems to be critical for processing our understanding of hunger is um, an area called the hypothalamus. And I talked about this a little bit in chapter two. Um, it's responsible for our four Fs, feeding, fighting, fleeing, and um, sex. Um, but uh, we're gonna talk about how the hypothalamus responds to hunger. And so um, your body is constantly keeping track of energy and food um, is your body's biggest source of energy just keeping you alive and having you move around all day, even if you are completely sedentary, even if you don't exercise, you just get up, you walk to class, you sit in class, you walk back to your dorm, you go home, you don't really do a lot of physical activity beyond that, that still takes energy. A coma patient still requires energy and your body needs energy to keep itself alive. These organs are not perpetual motion machines. They need energy to be able to keep going. And glucose is a huge source of energy. And your brain is one of the biggest users of glucose that there is. It's not the biggest, but it does require glucose as do all of your other body parts and organs. So your body is constantly keeping track of energy. And I kind of mentioned this before, I've had a couple of instances where my blood sugar has been low for whatever reason, and um, it is not a good time. I get pale, I get shaky, I pass out. I haven't had that happen in a really long time. And folks, um, what was happening today, not low blood sugar. Um, I occasionally get anxiety attacks, and I can tell you that's pretty much what it was. Um, I'm not quite sure why, um, but Needless to say, they don't happen all the time, but I know how to deal with them. But low blood sugar is totally different. Um, my skin gets cold and clammy, I get pale, I pass out, and I usually feel better if I have a little food. Um, like I said, that really hasn't happened um, in a very long time. So glucose is a major source of energy for the body, and if it's low, uh, messages 
from the body are going to be sent to the brain so that you can keep track of those signals and ideally engage in some eating behavior so you can get the energy that your body requires. Um, so what you're looking at here, this is obviously not a human brain. This is the brain of a rat. Um, and in particular, we are going to be looking at this little portion of the hypothalamus of a rat. So um, you may not necessarily know this because when they show pictures in your textbook, the hypothalamus looks like one little brain area, but it's actually a cluster of different areas um, of different groups of cells, as you see here, and they're made up of different components. So the first one that we are going to talk about, um, they're color coded for your convenience, but they are not actually colored this way in the brain. Uh, what you're looking at here is the lateral hypothalamus. And this is an area that is really critical for stimulating your sense of hunger. So when you're hungry, it's the thing that kind of starts really sending signals to get you to eat. Um, researchers have found that if you um, basically destroy destroy this area uh, in a rat. So if you destroy the lateral hypothalamus, the rat will show uh, no interest in eating. It will basically become anorexic. And not in terms of um, anorexia, nerv anorexia nervosa, uh, the eating disorder, the rat will have absolutely no interest in eating and it will basically starve itself to death. Now, um, the one thing that we kind of talked about before I bailed. Um, so here is a cute little puffball rat. And as I kind of mentioned, um, this rat looks really cute, but it's so fat that it can't walk. That is probably not a very good position for a rat to be in. This rat is being weighed on a scale. And once again, it has to basically be put in this little plate because it can't move. The researchers have to care, have to basically have it in that, uh, in that dish on the scale. Uh, this is a rat that has had its ventromedial hypothalamus destroyed, which is located right here. So again, ventro meaning lower, medial meaning towards the interior of the brain, as you see here. This is a part of our brain that is critical for um, a concept called satiety which is basically feeling full. So this is your sending signals to your body that you're full and you need to stop eating. Um, and generally we have found that if you destroy the ventromedial hypothalamus right here, the rat will basically eat to the point where it is it grows so fat that it is no longer able to walk. So this is something we do not want as well. So how does the hypothalamus work with humans. So it kind of goes without saying that um, body weight and weight control in human beings is really, really complicated. Um, and also uh, there are a lot of different ideas on how to do it um, and different things like that. Having said that though, here's what we know. Um, and I want to I want to be very careful about how I couch this because some of these things we're learning new information about them all the time, and so my goal is to tell you what I know. And these things could change. Um, one thing that we know is that your hypothalamus basically acts as what we call a weight thermostat, so to speak. You have a set point where your weight generally tends to want to settle. So something like this kind of happens with me um, if I go somewhere or, for example, if I go visit family on the 4th of July and I kind of eat a little more food than I normally do, I get back home and I've gained a couple of pounds. And then within the next couple of days, when I get back onto my normal diet, and I'm not really, I, and, and let's be clear, I'm not tracking my food, I'm not really measuring, I'm just eating healthy food as much as possible, I'm using reasonable portions. Um, it's pretty easy to get back to that weight without having to do a lot of calorie counting or my fitness pal or anything like that. So there's this idea that your body kind of has a weight that it wants to settle at. Now you hear me say that and you're kind of like, oh, that means I'm meant to be this weight. This range is maybe 
might be about like 20 to 30 pounds, give or take. Um, so it's less of a point and more of a range. Um, so it's part of the reason why a lot of people tend to gain a lot of weight. And, well, not a lot, but they maybe gain like five, 10 pounds in the winter. Um, we're eating more food. Uh, we have more holidays that encourage overindulgence in food. And then usually most people tend to lose all that weight in the summer when it's hot and you don't necessarily want to stay inside all the time. So your body kind of has a, a weight that it wants to settle at. Now, there are a couple of things that kind of influence this. Heredity does play some role in things like our body weight. It also plays a role in our body type. So um, I'm um, I'm pretty slender on top. I like I am like I have clavicles. You can see them. Um, on the other hand, I tend to store a lot of weight in my lower body. Um, my thighs are pretty thick and so is uh, my rear end. That's where I tend to store a lot of my weight. Um, and no matter how much weight I lose, I'm always going to tend to store my weight there. That is because um, on my dad's side of the family, a lot of people tend to store weight that way. And my mother and my sister, on the other hand, they tend to store more weight in their upper body. So they have nice little skinny legs. Uh, mine are very nice and thick and muscular. And... Um, and they tend to tend to store weight either in their chest or uh, in their stomach. So heredity absolutely plays a role with your body type and that's your body shape is not necessarily going to change. Now let's talk a little bit about how this weight thermostat works, so to speak. Um, generally, if you lose weight, um, your body is not necessarily going to think that it's starving, but what your body's gonna do is it's noticing that something's different. And so uh, if you've lost weight, a lot of things are going to basically um, make you want to increase your food intake to kind of get you back to those levels that you were eating before. But here's the other thing. When you lose weight, um, you obviously have less weight to carry around, which means that your energy output is going to decrease. Um, additionally, uh, we do know that there are things like fidgeting and um, extra energy that's burned off just by moving around. And one of the things that we know is that when you lose weight, you don't really engage in those activities anymore. So we actually have a name for this. Um, it's called NEET. It stands for um, Non-Exercise Energy Thermogenesis. So this could include the energy that you burn from a lot of different incidental movements, that includes things like walking, standing around, fidgeting, and things like that. And generally, we're going to find that if you're carrying less weight, um, those activities are going to burn less energy, just in general. Somebody who weighs 100 pounds is not going to expend as much energy in those activities than somebody who weighs 250. Though uh, the person who's 100 pounds is carrying a lot less weight and thus using a less energy expenditure. Now here's what happens when you gain weight though. Um, your body is going to try to decrease your food intake. And additionally, because you are carrying a little bit more weight, your energy output is going to increase. So there's this idea that your weight is going to want to settle. Now this can, your set point can change. If you gain weight and stay at that weight, for a long enough period of time, that can potentially function as your new set point. If you lose weight and are able to keep that off for a certain period of time, your body is going to adjust to that new set point as well. <laughs> okay, so part of the reason that I bring this up in general is that it the way that we um, the way that we live our lives now and the way that we get our food and the way that we conduct our lives, things are a lot more convenient than they used to be. And this convenience is very, very advantageous and it can also be very dis or it can also lead to disadvantages. Now, um, in prior times before we had all of this convenience, such as in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, uh, 
fat is an ideal form of stored energy. So if you look at the calories that are in kind of each macro of fat versus um, a macro of carbohydrates or a macro of protein, fat has about nine kilocalories. That is a massive amount of energy compared to something like carbohydrates or protein, which only tend to give you about four. So that's over double the amount of energy. And especially during times of famine, um, fat can be used to basically be an excess form of energy. Now, um, previously in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, generally it was very, very uncommon to see people that might have carried excess weight uh, unless they were wealthy and had access to food and people could do things for them. Um, and so during times of famine and during times where um, kind of foods of convenience and meals of convenience were a lot harder to come by, um, you could kind of see that a heavier body was actually prized. And this is just me kind of reminding you that beauty and what we think of as beautiful is very, very subjective and it changes with the time and the culture. Speaking of time and culture, we are now in a situation where food is so plentiful, it's very, very cheap and easy to get. And additionally, with a lot of these hyper-processed, hyper-palatable foods, um, now more than ever, we are having an issue where a lot of people are wanting to figure out how they can control their weight because they weigh too much. And so we're gonna talk just a little bit about obesity and weight control. And I'm gonna be very, very careful about how I talk about this. Um, I used to be pretty heavy. Um, at one point, I weighed maybe about 230 pounds uh, when I graduated high school. And I remember how hard things were and I remember being bullied and I certainly do not want to do that to anybody here. Um, I encourage you, no matter what size you are, um, to live a healthy life and it's never too late and you are generally never too large to be able to make even, even small steps in the right direction. No matter how much you weigh, you can make steps to be healthier today. Um, whether that's um, thinking about the kinds of foods you eat, um, moving your body more, trying to manage your stress and manage your mental health, all of those things are important to create a healthy you. So this is me basically saying this, not to shame, not to bully, but to just talk about this in relationship to health and why I think it's important. So here's what we know. Now, um, we do know a few things about carrying extra weight. And this is especially true for people who are carrying a significant amount of extra weight there is an increased risk of mortality. Uh, that is especially true once we start getting into um, massive extremes. Um, you will also notice that even if you're a little bit underweight, um, that can also lead to a relative risk of death compared to people that have a healthier BMI. Now let's be really clear, BMI is not a perfect metric. Um, generally it is, and for the most part, it's not a good metric. Um, and I would also argue that in addition to looking at BMI, you should look at things like your body fat percentage, your waist circumference, get your blood work done. Um, BMI is just one part of the picture. Um, but we do tend to find that at those higher levels indicating um, extreme obesity, if I'm not mistaken, I believe it's termed uh, class three or um, it's being severely underweight, both of those things can be incredibly unhealthy. But generally in this country, um, more people tend to be obese than underweight. I believe uh, the last uh, metric that I heard is about 38% of the United States uh, qualifies as technically being obese. And obesity, um, and again, this is not about what you look like, this is not about your worth. Um, if you're struggling with your weight, it's not about that at all. It's about health. And one of the things that we know is that these things are correlated with increased health risk, uh, such as high blood pressure, which we know about 50% of adults tend to have, 
and that can be tied to a lot of negative outcomes like cardiovascular issues, stroke, things like that. Uh, it does increase the risk of type 2 diabetes, heart disease, possibly even Alzheimer's disease. And for somebody like me, um, Alzheimer's disease runs in my family. I've got two grandparents with it. If I can potentially be as healthy as I can, obviously it's not 100% foolproof, anything could happen. But if I have an opportunity to reduce my risk, I'm gonna wanna take it. Now, having said all of this, so carrying extra weight puts more force on your body. It puts more force on your joints. Um, it puts more pressure on your lungs, which is why we do hear that um, it can be a, not a risk factor for catching COVID, but it can be a risk factor for how you handle COVID. Because if you're already having issues with your lungs for a variety of different reasons, or if that extra weight is putting pressure on your lungs, that can be a real problem. But I'm going to be really clear. I don't think it's okay to shame people for their weight. And one of the things that we do know in this country is that in general, there are very strong social penalties for being overweight or obese. And that is especially true if you're female. So let me be clear. You should not be a jerk to somebody because they weigh, they weigh more than you do. Don't be a jerk to that person. That person already probably already knows what they weigh. Um, they don't need your help. We want, we want people to be healthy, but we don't want to shame them and we don't want to bully them. And in general, there's a lot of research out there that it shows that shaming people for their weight never really works. And if anything, it tends to backfire. I know that when I was heavier, um, if somebody made fun of me for my weight, it made me feel bad. It didn't necessarily make me go, huh, you know, maybe I should focus on eating healthier foods. And maybe the next time my boyfriend suggests going to Olive Garden, I should say no. It didn't make me think that. It made me want to go wallow in food as a form of comfort, but it ends up making the problem worse. Um, so we know that there are social penalties. So what you're looking at here um, is a scale for normal and overweight. So not even obese, just overweight, men and women. And here, um, these applications were given to employers and they were asked to indicate a willingness to hire on a scale of one to seven. Um, and I don't really like this graph because it starts at zero when it really should be at one. But what I'd like you to pay attention to is that in general, compared to normal weight men and women, employers were less likely to hire overweight men and women. Now, notice too that that discrepancy is even more likely um, if the woman is overweight. One of the other things that we know because of some of the social stigmas that are associated with being overweight or obese is that these people are less likely to seek healthcare. Um, first of all, going in and looking at the scale. Now, being measured and being weighed is important. It can tell the doctor a lot of important things. It helps out dosages uh, for medications, but um, that can be really traumatizing for some people. Um, additionally, sometimes certain doctors, certainly not all, don't necessarily listen to a patient's concerns and they assume that weight loss is always the answer. Now, sometimes it is. If you're having issues with your knees, it seems that a possibility could be that losing weight helps take some of the pressure off of those joints, but it could be something else entirely. And it's worth checking out a variety of different options rather than just lose weight. It'll fix everything. It may not fix everything. We need other options there. Um, and additionally, the internet is definitely not very helpful. So here is a tweet from a, um, an adjunct at NYU, um, basically saying to applicants who are overweight or obese, dear obese PhD applicants, if you didn't have the willpower to stop eating carbs, you won't have the willpower to do a dissertation, hashtag true. Um, so I'm just gonna put this out there. I love carbs and also apples are carbs. Um, I didn't have the willpower to stop eating carbs, but I did have the willpower to do a dissertation. So eh, I don't know what to think about that. Um, other people on the internet decided to do fat shaming week. And again, fat shaming is not a good way to get people to change. 
It often ends up um, making people feel worse about themselves and engaging in unhealthy coping mechanisms. Generally, the last thing that I wanted to do, when the biggest thing that I wanted to do if somebody shamed me about my weight, I'd wanna go eat a cookie, maybe another. And it, it just generally doesn't work and the data backs that up. There are other ways that we can encourage people to be healthier that do not require making them feel bad about their bodies. Now, here's a couple of things that we know about obesity. And for a lot of people, um, it can be very, very difficult to keep weight off. Um, now, part of that is due to the fact that a lot of people are looking for kind of quick fix diets. Um, my mother did keto. Um, I have tried paleo. Um, and a lot of people, I've, I've heard about cabbage soup diets and cookie diets and juice cleanses. And none of these are really meant to be sustainable over the long term, but people really like those instantaneous results. But those are not meant to lead to long term change. Um, and so a lot of people have difficulty keeping weight off because of that. But there's something else to keep in mind related to physiology. Um, you have at any given point, about 30 to 40 billion fat cells in your body. And one of the things that we know is that when you um, generally when you gain weight, and especially if you're putting more body fat onto your body, um, that increases the number of the fat cells, and they also increase in size. Now, here's what's really critical. Once those fat cells, those new fat cells have grown, you can't ungrow them. So matter cannot be destroyed at that point. It can only really shrink in size. So once you've created new fat cells, they don't really go anywhere. So what ends up happening if you end up losing a lot of weight permanently and you're able to keep that weight off? What will your, what will your fat cells look like compared to somebody who never had that issue? And what we actually find is that for somebody who has managed to lose a lot of weight, but they used to be obese, you can see that the fat cells are much smaller but there are still a lot more of them because once new ones have been created, they can't really be destroyed. They can't be disappeared out of existence. They just become smaller. And some of this can actually make permanent weight loss difficult. Not impossible, but a little bit more difficult. Now, I will say that probably one of the best ways that you can kind of keep an eye on your weight is kind of keeping track of your calories. But it's gonna be a little bit more complicated than that. Some people do well with certain types of diets. Um, I generally am vegan or vegetarian, depending on the day. Um, and that really works well for my body. It's been really great for my cholesterol. It's been really great for my blood pressure and my heart. Some of you need to do things like intermittent fasting. Some of you are on a carnivore diet. Some of you are, um, you love your carbs. You might be like my sister and you love your bread and cheese diet. Um, so not only do the calories matter, the type of food that you're getting and whether or not it works for your body mat matters as well. And here's the other thing. You really don't wanna drop down too many of your caloric needs. So um, your body has that weight thermostat. And if you cut your calories too low, if you cut them too low, um, your body may think that it's starving itself. And it may try to hold on to every bit of energy that it gets, which is why um, it's occasionally recommended that if you want sustainable weight loss, you shouldn't really reduce your caloric intake, but more than a couple of hundred calories. It doesn't have to, you don't need to be eating less than 1200 calories a day. Um, that's not good for anybody, but just a few hundred calories a day, like one or 200, maybe 250 tops, but just reducing that, that small amount a little bit each day, it feels more doable, it feels more sustainable, and your body's not going to basically flip out on you and try to, and basically act like it's in starvation mode. Now, here's what's interesting. So I mentioned this before that when you lose weight, um, 
because you're carrying less weight, you burn less energy. So I mentioned that non-exercise energy thermogenesis, like the, the, the energy that you burn just from things like walking or fidgeting. And when you weigh less, you burn less. So what this means is that your caloric intake um, might is definitely if when you lose weight, your caloric requirements are going to be less than they used to be because you're burning less energy. You may not be able to eat the full way that you used to because your body requires less energy now. Um, and there is some data that shows that especially if you've just done a major weight loss, your energy needs might even be lower than someone who is the same weight as you that never lost a lot of weight, at least temporarily. It does tend to level off after a couple of years when your body figures out this is kind of where it wants to settle, but it does kind of mean, and it's really not a lot of work. Like I, I, some people might say that this is a lot of work to, oh, you need to eat less than you used to. Um, I mean, I don't necessarily see it that way. Um, if you see it that way, I think that's totally fine. Um, but it generally doesn't stop after weight loss. Um, you can't necessarily go back to the way that you were eating before, at least not all the time. Um, I used to down like maybe half a pizza or like one of those little Totino's pizzas. First of all, those, those little Totino's party pizzas are really gross and I could get better pizza. And just in general, I don't need as much food as I used to because my body doesn't really burn as much energy as it used to. So genetics matter, at least to some extent for this. Um, we know a couple of things. So I've already mentioned that heredity uh, in, uh, affects things like your body shape and also where you tend to store weight. We know a couple of things. Identical twins do tend to have a similar weight, uh, even when they're raised apart and in studies of adopted children, weight does tend to resemble biological parents rather than adoptive parents. Now, having said that, so clearly genetics matter, but let's be honest, our environment really matters too. Let's talk about some things that can be um, making us a little bit more unhealthy that are kind of built into our society. In general, we don't usually get enough physical activity. Um, I believe right now that it's been estimated that you should be getting about 150 minutes a week of moderate physical activity. And that's basically 30 minutes for five days a week of walking. Um, and most people don't even hit that. Now, I hit a lot of that just because of all the work I do teaching and I walk to work and things like that but the average person really does not get a lot of physical activity. Now let's be really clear. You can exercise all you want, but if you eat too much, let's be clear. I run three miles, I can maybe burn about 200 to 300 calories in that process. Exercise can't fix a bad diet. Um, as they used to say at one of the gyms I go to, you can't really outrun your fork. Um, but Physical activity is good for us. It's good for our bodies. It makes us feel better. Uh, if you're doing things like weight training or body weight work, it can help build your bones um, and make them stronger. Uh, it can prevent against things for like osteoporosis. Physical activity is good for you. It should be fun to challenge your body um, and try new things and see what your body is capable of. Now, I'll be honest with you. Does it always feel good? Not at first. Um, there are some times when I lift weights where right in the middle of it, I'm like, I am not enjoying this. There are times at the beginning of my run where I'm thinking this really sucks. Um, so it's not 100% fun all the time, but I would encourage you to find an exercise that you enjoy and do not actively hate that you could see yourself doing every day. I like to run. I like to ride my bike, um, my exercise bike. I do not have a bike bike. Um, I do these things because they make me feel good. If you like to dance, if you like to do yoga, if you like to do like um, MMA or things like that, do those things. Move your body in a way that is fun and challenging for you. Uh, additionally, our food quality is really poor. 
Um, there is a book that I love called Salt, Sugar, Fat. We actually have a copy of it in the library. Um, we have food that is very, very cheap and very, very easy to make and very easy to prepare, but it's full of a lot of sugar. It's full of a lot of fat and it's full of a lot of salt. It's hyper processed and it's hyper palatable and it can basically create almost an addictive kind of power um, versus food that tends to be things like fruits and vegetables and stuff like that. So the quality of our food is poor and that's especially true if you live in an area where fresh fruit and vegetables are very, very difficult to come by, areas that are known as food deserts. In general, we as a country are pretty sleep deprived. And we also know that sleep is, uh, and how much you're getting can affect your metabolism. Additionally, when you're around people, um, social influences can really play a role. So I know, for example, that if my partner makes brownies, um, he is definitely going to say, you want a brownie? And I'll say, yeah, I kind of want a brownie because that social influence is there. Um, if he weren't there, if he weren't making brownies, I probably wouldn't have one. But when other people are around and they decide to get a pizza, the social influence can be really strong. Um, if you watch your friend clean their plate at a restaurant, you're going to be more likely to do the same. Now, am I telling you, <laughs> am I telling you that if your friends clean their plate or if you order a pizza, they, that you should leave? I am not telling you that. I am not telling you to deprive yourself of the things you want, but what I am saying is be mindful of the choices that you make. I have a brownie every now and then. I don't have brownies all the time. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and stop here. So we'll talk about the need to belong next time. And again, I'm sorry that I could not deliver this to you in class today. So thanks for being patient with me. I promise that I'm doing fine and I look forward to seeing you all on Friday. Bye.